Do I just begin? All right, I'm, um, we're all ready to go. Uh, it'll be roughly like um, Greg's, except Udunamei Peripatein Kailegen Hama. That is ancient Greek for I cannot walk around and speak at the same time. <laughs> so in that sense, Greg is more of a peripatetic than I am. So. Uh, it should be roughly uh, 40 minutes, 20 minutes, uh, uh, something like that. So, um, I mean, 20 minutes Q&A. I leave you enough time. So. Now, it must have been obvious to anyone who encountered the teenage Aristotle uh, in the northern Greek city of Stagira, his hometown, or perhaps in Pella, the capital of Macedonia, that he was not your average boy. His father, Nicomachus, according to some ancient sources, the physician to King Amyntas of Macedonia, he was aware that such a child required and deserved the best education possible, which could not be found in Macedonia or northern Greece. So at the age of 17, Aristotle was sent to study at Plato's Academy in Athens, which is about four and a half kilometers from here. He remained there for two decades, first as a student of, Ara of, of Plato and then as a colleague, writing dialogues and other works and gradually moving away from Platonism philosophically. He stayed until Plato's death in 347. Now, there is evidence that Aristotle left the academy and Athens for either one of two reasons or both. Because Plato's nephew, Spusippus, was made scholarch, that means the head of the school, of the academy at Plato's death. The reason, literal nepotism, right? Uh, the reason for which might well have been that Aristotle had moved away from Platonism, and or because of anti-Macedonian feelings in Athens. Macedonian excursions into Greece under King Philip II were already beginning to be felt in the north. Now, I think it's important to mention, this came up yesterday in the panel, it's important to mention that despite their obvious and fundamental uh, philosophical differences, all the evidence is that Aristotle loved and respected Plato until the very end. In the Nicomachean Ethics, a work named after his father, or maybe his son, who was also a Nicomachus, when criticizing Platonic forms, Aristotle says, quote, though we love both the truth and our friends, reverence is due the truth first, unquote. And in a poem that Aristotle, that Aristotle wrote, he said that Plato was, quote, a man whom it is not right for the evil to praise, who was alone or first among mortals to show clearly, both by his own way of life and by his method of reasoning, that go the good man is also a happy man, unquote. At Plato's death, Aristotle left the Greek mainland for Assos uh, of the northwest, it's northwest coast of Asia Minor, but it was a Greek uh, uh, city, before uh, moving on to the island of Lesbos. It is very, very likely that during this period, he began his extensive work in biology. And this is also when he met up and began to work with Theophrastus, who was from Lesbos. And you know, he, had, he may have met him earlier in, in the academy. Now, Theophrastus would remain a colleague of Aristotle's uh, until the latter's death, and I'll have more to say about him later. In 343, Aristotle was called to Pella by Philip II to tutor uh, his 13-year-old son, little Alex, uh, Alexander, who would then become the great, of course, for which, according to Plutarch, Aristotle was very well paid. Although this lasted only a couple of years, it is believed that Aristotle stayed in Macedonia until 335. These eight years are the period for which we have the least amount of information about Aristotle's life, but it can be assumed, given his extraordinary output, that he continued his research and writing on a vast array of topics. For instance, one scholar has speculated that it was during this period that Aristotle compiled his massive six-volume work, now lost, called The Homeric Problems. Written, it is argued, for the purpose of discussing Homer with Alexander and other young Macedonian royalty. Did Aristotle have an influence on Alexander? Probably not. But two fragments survive that suggest he might have hoped to. A lost work of Aristotle's called On Kingship, which may have been addressed to Alexander, gives this piece of meta-advice. Quote, It is not necessary for the king himself to do philosophy. No philosopher kings, right? Rather, it will hinder him, 
but the king should be open to hearing and being persuaded by those genuine philosophers whom one encounters, unquote. <laughs> and according to Plutarch, Aristotle told Alexander, quote, to behave to, toward the Greeks as their leader and, their bar and towards barbarians as their master, unquote. Anyway, um, Alexander did not follow uh, this advice. There is some evidence that Alexander influenced Aristotle, however, to this extent, or at least in one respect. According to Athenaeus, uh, Alexander bankrolled Aristotle's Historia Animalium. So that's something. In 338, Philip II defeated an alliance of Greek city-states uh, um, led by Athens and Thebes in the Battle of Chironea, at which point Athens and the rest of the Greek mainland were, in effect, ruled by Macedonia. This likely made it possible for Aristotle to return to Athens comfortably to establish his own school. He was in fact a friend of the Macedonian regent in Athens, Antipater, who had been a general of uh, um, Philip and then Alexander. Diogenes Laertius, the most important bi uh, biographical source we have for Aristotle, tells us that, quote, Aristotle's arrival at Athens was in the second year of the 111th Olympiad, that's 335 BC, and he lectured in the Lyceum for 13 years, unquote. Now, as a resident alien, Aristotle was not allowed to buy land in Athens or even establish a school on rented land inside the city walls. But he was given special permission to use a public area, a sort of park, just outside the city walls, an area which was dedicated to Apollo Luceos, known as the Luceon, or as we call it following the Latin, the Lyceum. Here we are, part of it anyway. Incidentally, ancient Greek gods tended to have one or more surnames, right? so to speak. For example, Poseidon Earthshaker. The most natural rendering of Luceos is Lupine, that of or pertaining to wolves, from the ancient Greek lukos, meaning wolf, right? So that would mean something like Apollo wolf god. But some scholars believe the name derives from Lycia. It's a region of Asia Minor where the twins Apollo and Artemis were said to have been born. But my favorite theory, it's purely motivated by bias, right? my favorite theory is that the name Apollo Luceos derives from the Greek, the Greek luke, meaning light, in which case it would mean something like Apollo light giver. Enlightenment, yeah, that's, uh, I think, perfect. There are ancient, uh, this is not just, you know, over-the-top speculation. There are ancient texts that support all three of these readings, these interpretations. The Lyceum was established and dedicated to Apollo Luceos, likely in the 6th century B.C. So this was not, you know, established as the Lyceum by Aristotle, right? Uh, likely in the 6th century BC, and it served as a park in gymnasium in the sense of a, a, an exercise area and a general meeting place. There's evidence that there were military drills here. Ancient sources, this is like Strabo and Pausanias, they locate the Lyceum, they give where the Lyceum was, which enabled um, scholars to try to hunt for it, and they found it in the 90s uh, under a parking lot, I believe. Um, uh, they locate the Lyceum outside and to the east of the ancient city walls, surrounded by the Elysos River to the south and the Eridanus River and Mount Lucubetos uh, uh, to the north. Now, neither of these rivers exist today. I think there may be roads around here. But the Lucubetos Hill, Lophos Likavitu, uh, excuse my Greek, um, is a little over a kilometer directly north. I think we've established in, over there somewhere. Some of us will be having dinner there one night. So clearly the present archaeological site is merely one part of what was the Lyceum. Now the literary and archaeological evidence shows that there were eventually a number of buildings and other structures located on the site. A gymnasium building, dressing room, running tracks, stoas, those are porches, you know, covered structures, a palestra, which apparently is over there. Um, they've located that. Uh, religious structures like shrines, after all this was a sanctuary dedicated to Apollo. There was a seated assembly area. I don't think you guys, well maybe you're exactly where it was. Um, and there were dot 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 
shaded walkways known as parapetoi. That sounds peripatetic, right? That's so the Lyceum was known for uh, the Lyceum was known for having many trees and so plenty of shaded uh, places, as well as a few streams and even man-made canals. Theophrastus, Aristotle's successor, he tells us in his work the Historia Plantarum, discussing the growth rates of roots. He reports that quote in the Lyceum, the plane tree near the canal when it was still young sent out roots about thirty-three forearms long. Uh, having both room and nourishment. That was a, from elbow to fingertip, uh, known as the cubit in the Bible, right? It's about 50 feet or um, 15 meters. Now, it must be noted that as early as the 5th century BC, the Lyceum had become a favorite spot in Athens for philosophical discussion for all sorts of philosophers. An area called the Academy, near an olive grove and sacred to Athena, was another such popular spot. Prodicus the Sophist is said to have delivered a speech in the Lyceum. Plato's dialogue Lysis begins with the character Socrates walking from the academy to the Lyceum to see its new palestra, right? uh, its wrestling training area. And this is the venue, so to speak, for the, both the dialogues, the Lysis and the Euthydemus. So it's very likely that the historical Socrates and his followers, a number of sophists, and later Plato and his associates, including the young uh, Aristotle, spent their time walking around and between the Academy and the Lyceum discussing philosophy. Now, I'll mention now, without getting too far ahead of myself, that eventually uh, Theophrastus, although a non-citizen, was able to get permission to purchase land for their school at the Lyceum. Owing to the help of his former student and peripatetic philosopher, Demetrius of Phalerum, who was an Athenian citizen and a highly successful statesman. Eventually, after some time, Aristotle and his followers were referred to in antiquity as the men from the Lyceum, or the men from the Peripatos, or just the Peripatetics, the Hoi Peripateticoi. Now, this latter term is still in use today, is derived either from the walkways that I mentioned, the parapetoi um, that they frequented, or I think more likely it's from the verb parapetain, to walk, right? Uh, to walk around, sorry. Uh, Aristotle was said to be in the habit of walking while teaching, and you had a demonstration earlier um, today from a, from a later peripatetic. Now, a brief word brief in large part because the evidence is so scanty about how the school functioned under Aristotle and likely for some time after him as well. Diogenes Laertius tells us that lectures and I suspect seminars for advanced students took place in the morning and public talks, I'm not sure who it was open to, but public talks took place in the afternoon. Scholars tend to agree that this likely corresponds to the two kinds of works that Aristotle was said to have written. Advanced works for insiders called esoteric, which basically means, it means for insiders. It's not, not woozy, mystical stuff, right? Um, and then the more polished works for the public were known as uh, the outsiders called exoteric, right? It is also agreed that most, if not all, of Aristotle's extant works are insider works, Fragments of the other kind, however, some of which were dialogues, do survive. Now, one important feature of the Lyceum as a school of the Peripatetics was Aristotle's library, which was famous in antiquity. This must have included, of course, all of his own works and eventually those of his students and colleagues and included notebook collections of data preliminary to research, as well as many other works of, of of other philosophers broadly understood to include scientists, medical writers, mathematicians, what have you. Though some of these may have been excerpted, as we know that the most important list of Aristotle's works, which I'll get to presently, included extracts from Plato's Laws and extracts from Plato's Republic. Diogenes Laertius writes that Aristotle's writings, quote, are very numerous, and considering the man's all-around excellence, I deemed it incumbent on me to catalog them, 
unquote. He then lists over 150 works, one of them being, quote, constitutions of 158 city-states, unquote. Only one of these survives. It was discovered in the uh, deserts of Egypt in the 19th century. That's the Athenian constitution, which is, you know, a little, you know, it's, it's uh, 158 of them. That's pretty massive too. Now, at the end of the list, Diogenes writes, quote, in all 445,270 lines, unquote. And for all that, we know the list is incomplete. It does not mention the metaphysics or the Nicomachean ethics. Now, I chose 15 titles at random of works which have not survived. We can all weep together. On poets, erotic love, on wealth, astronomy, exhortation to study philosophy, on prayer, on kingship, I already mentioned that one, on scientific knowledge, peri epistemes, right? on pleasure, against the, the Pythagoreans, on dissections in eight works, in eight books, on mythological animals, on medicine, optics, and on music. Other ancient biographies list other lost works not mentioned by Diogenes. For instance, on the Nile, on meteors, on liquids. But that's enough to give you an idea of what's been lost. Scholars estimate that only about one-fifth of what he wrote survives. We have all of Plato. Ancient sources claim that Aristotle left Athens. Okay, sorry. I, I'm grateful to whoever arranged for the birds to arrive, but there were no monk parakeets here when Aristotle was writing on birds. Uh, <laughs> oh, sorry. Uh, ancient sources claim that Aristotle left Athens in 323 in order to, to avoid being tried for impiety. It is generally thought that with the death of Alexander the Great that same year at the age of 33, there was a surge of anti-Macedonian feelings in Athens, and Aristotle was not only from that area, as I said, he was also a friend of Antipater, the Macedonian regent. The charge of impiety was almost certainly politically motivated, so he left Athens supposedly saying, quote, I will not let Athens sin twice against philosophy, unquote, a clear reference to Socrates. Aristotle went to Colchis, where his mother's family owned land, and according to most accounts, he died of an illness the following year at the age of 62. I'm 62. I have no intention of going anywhere for at least 20 or 30 years, and uh, so I weep to think that he died so young, because, yeah. One ancient biography, however, claims that Aristotle committed suicide because he could not explain the strange move movements of the Euripus Strait, a narrow channel of water separating the Greek island of Euboea from the mainland. It has this famous strong, it was famous for its strong current that would change directions um, multiple times a day. I'm dubious, but, you know, if he was going to kill himself, um, yeah, I could see it over, a, well, whatever, I won't, <laughs> there's, there's no speculation worth making here. Now, Diogenes Laertius has preserved Aristotle's will. Aristotle named Antipater as his executor. His daughter was to wed Nic Nicanor, a Macedonian officer and Aristotle's adopted son. But if anything happens to him beforehand, she is to marry Theophrastus if he wishes. She married the, the first guy. He also bequeathed to Theophrastus his house in Sagira. And other sources claim that Theophrastus inherited Aristotle's library. Aristotle also wrote in his will, quote, Do not sell any of the slaves who served me, but employ them. And when they come of age, send them away free men as they deserve, unquote. Among other things, Aristotle also commissions statues of Zeus and Athena be set up in Stagira, his birthplace. There is no mention in the will of who is to take over his school. But Aulus Gellius, a later Roman author, um, in one of his stories, he has a work called The Attic Nights, a series of, of stories. Uh, there's one, uh, get this title, 
on the philosophers Aristotle, Theophrastus, and Eudemus, and the elegant tact of Aristotle in choosing his successor to the school. That's the title. He reports, uh, Aulus Gellius reports, that when Aristotle was already showing signs of illness, but still in the, at the Lyceum and still in Athens, a group of his, philosophers, his followers asked him to choose a scholark, and he said he would think about it. Aulus says that there were many good men in the Lyceum, but two were preeminent. Eudemus of Rhodes and Theophrastus of Lesbos. And that's pretty much true. I mean, that so far as we can tell, they were, I think, uh, head and shoulders above the rest. A bit later, Aristotle asked his associates for some exotic wine from Rhodes and from Lesbos. He drank the one from Rhodes and said, quote, a full-bodied wine by Heracles and agreeable, unquote. Then he drank the other and said, quote, both are exceedingly good, but the one from Lesbos is more pleasant, unquote. And that was apparently the way he indicated, according to this story, that Theophrastus um, was the successor. I don't know if I'd refer to that as elegant tact, but it's something, right? True or not, there is abundance uh, of evidence that Theophrastus was Aristotle's successor. We know that. Now, a few more words are in order on Theophrastus. According to Diogenes Laertius, he wrote on a wide range of subjects, as wide as Aristotle. And Diogenes' list of his works includes over 150 titles. There survived two massive works on botany, a number of brief scientific treatises, I'm going to name them all, on sweat, on fatigue, on dizziness, on stones, on fire, on odors, on fish that remain on land, on sense perception, and my personal favorite, on winds. He too wrote a, a work called Metaphysics, which is quite important, and perhaps his most popular work is Characters, a set of 30 character sketches of vicious people. The Coward is one chapter, The Superstitious Man. Like Aristotle, Theophrastus first came to Athens to study with Plato, probably several, several years after Aristotle did. But at some point he left and joined Aristotle, as I said, perhaps meeting with him on the island of Lesbos. Uh, according to Diogenes, uh, Theophrastus' actual name was Tertamus, but Aristotle gave him the nickname Theophrastus, which means divine speaker. Further, Aristotle said of two of his students, Theophrastus and Callisthenes, that since Theophrastus interpreted every thought with extreme quickness, whereas Callisthenes was naturally sluggish, Theophrastus needed a bridle and Callisthenes a spur. Quink th quick thinking and divine speaking coming from Aristotle is pretty high praise. So Diogenes tells us that after Theophrastus, the scholarchs of the Lyceum were Strato of Lemsacus, heading the school till 269, and then Lyco of Troas, who held the position for 44 years till 225. Um, now, according to uh, the famous German classicist Willamowitz, um, Lyco of Troas was the death blow, or the Totenschaft, uh, which is uh, the death sleep, I guess. But it was a really bad thing for, uh, for the Lyceum, and we'll say more about the decline later. There's no clear evidence about the scholarchs who follow these two, though other sources mention uh, the names of others. Now, we know the names of some peripatetics who were alive during Aristotle's lifetime and worked with him, though they weren't scholarchs. For instance, Aristoxenus, who did a lot of work on music, and Eudemus. Demetrius, the, polit the politician and student of Theophrastus, who I mentioned earlier, uh, may have been a scholarch. Three peripatetics closely associated with Theophrastus were uh, Phineas, Chameleon, and Praxiphanes. If you were my students at university, I would say you don't need to know these names for the exam. Uh, others who came later were Aristo, Hieronymus, Dicaearchus, Clearchus, and Critoleus, to name a few. Now, collections of the fragments of the lost works of each of these writers have been published or are in the works uh, under the auspices of the project Theophrastus. Extant works survive for none of them. Uh, after Theophrastus, there's, there's no extant uh, works until we get to the, to the um, Roman period much later. Unfortunately, despite its continued existence, the intellectual power and influence of the Lyceum diminished. 
And as a result, there are major gaps in the historical record. But here are a couple highlights from the second century uh, BC. In the, in the 160s, when the Roman conquest of Macedonia and Greece was well underway, Marcus Aurelius, the Roman emperor and Stoic philosopher, established four chairs, thronoi, it's Greek, right? Um, four chairs of philosophy in Athens, one each for Platonism, Aristotelianism, Stoicism, and Epicureanism. In 155 BC, Athens sent to Rome a delegation of three philosophers, Critoleos, Carneades, uh, and Diogenes of Babylon, I think, uh, representing the Aristotelian, Platonic, and Stoic schools, respectively. And they did it in order to negotiate with the Roman Senate in the hope of reducing or eliminating some fine that had been imposed on the Athenians. Further, Cicero treats Critoleos and his student Diodorus of Tyre as scholarchs. So it seems to be the case that at the time, uh, at this time, the Lyceum was in some sense a respected school that was still functioning. But how well it was functioning and what kind of influence it was exerting is unclear. Now, according to Plutarch and other ancient sources, the Roman general Sulla besieged Athens in 86 BC, during which time he ravaged the Lyceum and the Academy as well, because he was, um, okay, oh, 10 minutes, okay. It is reported that afterwards he took Aristotle's library, which had been neglected by Theophrastus' heirs, uh, and then lost for some time. He took them back to uh, Rome. It's a famous story, much of which scholars doubt, and which I won't take the time to present. But it does seem to be the case that the works of Aristotle were not being well preserved and copied and passed on. Be that as it may, Sulla's ravage of the Lyceum did not put an end to that school. There was one last revival. Ammonius, a 4th and 5th uh, century Neoplatonic philosopher, refers to Andronicus of Rhodes, who was active in the second half of the 1st century BC, as the 11th scholarch of the Lyceum. There is evidence that Andronicus was involved in compiling lists of Aristotle's works and putting them in what he thought was the proper order as well as writing commentaries on some of them, and that this led to an increase of interest in the study of Aristotle's works. Now, the climax of ancient Aristotelianism after Aristotle and Theophrastus is Alexander of Aphrodisias from around 150 to 220 AD, who held the chair in Aristotelian philosophy created by Marcus Aurelius, um, and so he was presumably the, arch, the, the um, scholarch. He deserves a lecture of his own, with one minor exception, Alexander is the only ancient Aristotelian after Theophrastus for whom any works survive complete, and there are a lot of them. He is the best ancient commentator on Aristotle by far, and he is absolutely brilliant on the issue of free will. And in rejecting the existence of the void, he anticipates what Ayn Rand called the fallacy of the reification of the zero. Now, what happens next? As Han Baltus writes in his book, The Peripatetics, quote, while the Lyceum experienced a brief revival during the late Roman Republic and early empire, which I've just described, as an active school, it vanished soon after 200, ousted by Platonism and Christianity, unquote. But as Hans Gottschalk puts it, quote, it is a well-known fact already noted in antiquity, he quotes Cicero, that the school founded by Aristotle's pupils to continue his teaching lost its intellectual vitality about 50 years after his death. Okay. It is perhaps ironic that in part what kept Aristotle alive, so to speak, were the massive commentaries on his works by the Platonic philosophers of late antiquity, like Porphyry, Philoponus, and especially Simplicius. Now, one cause of the decline of the school was no doubt the increasing rarity and eventual loss of many of Aristotle's works. Now, how did this happen? It wasn't only neglect. Galen gives us, the great medical writer, Galen gives us a clue in a work of his called On Avoiding Distress, which incidentally was only discovered in 2005 in a monastery in Thessaloniki. Makes us hopeful for so many things, right? Now, the distress that prompted the writing of this treatise was a fire in Rome in 192 AD in which both the Palatine Library, a major library of Rome, and Galen's, Galen's own 
private library stored in a separate warehouse were both destroyed completely. Galen tells us that he had been collecting works and correcting many of them, which were, which were in bad shape. Quote, such were the works of Theophrastus, Aristotle, Eudemus, Phineas, most of Chrys Chrysippus, the Stoic, and all the ancient doctors, unquote. He tells us, for instance, that he had found a rare copy of Aristotle's On Plants at the Palatine Library, which had not been included in the catalog, so it kind of fell through the cracks. Quote, I carefully found and transcribed it, but it is now lost, unquote. But the rarity and loss of many of Aristotle's uh, many of Aristotle's works cannot be a fundamental cause. What else led to the decline of the Lyceum? Baltus speculates that quote Aristotle's range of intellectual pursuits came to overshadow the successors of his own school. Often their efforts to preserve and continue his work became conflated in the later tradition. Unquote. Now I want to unpack this a bit. First, Aristotle was a hard act to follow, and his followers were not as brilliant as he was. This is true, but this is all, it's almost always true, right? It was true of Plato, for instance, and it was arguably true of Epicurus and the Epicureans, unless you think Lucretius is better than him, and it was true to some extent of the Stoics. Second, there's the vast range of Aristotle's inquiries. He wrote on logic, metaphysics, epistemology, philosophy of science, ethics, politics, aesthetics, but also on physics, biology, botany, and me meteorology. His followers attempted to pursue these different aspects of his thought, and that seems to have led to a, diff a diffuse study and scattered inquiry in the Lyceum, with some areas having received greater emphasis than others and some being neglected. Another problem related to this is what Ayn Rand called Thales' approach to philosophy. Quote, the idea that philosophy has to discover the nature of the universe in cosmological terms, unquote. She goes on to say that, quote, on this premise, every new step in physics has to mean a new metaphysics, unquote. She adds that, quote, Aristotle established the right metaphysics by establishing the law of identity, which was all that was necessary, plus the identification of the facts that only concretes exist. But he destroyed his metaphysics by his cosmology, by the whole nonsense of the moving spheres, the immovable movers, teleology, etc., unquote. Now, Aristotle and his followers did not distinguish between philosophy and the special sciences. And since Aristotle's views in both areas were incomplete uh, or mistaken in certain respects, and his science was often provisional, his followers often appropriately thought it that part of what they were doing was correcting and adding to Aristotle's own philosophy broadly understood. Sometimes such attempted corrections were in fact improvements. For instance, when Theophrastus argued or hypothesized that one did not need the unmovable movers to explain the motion of celestial objects, or less significant, when Strato located the seat of reason in the brain rather than the heart, not a reference to emotion, but... Sometimes the corrections were innocuous, for instance, when Theophrastus corrected Aristotle on the mystery of mistletoe generation. I won't elaborate. Or Clearchus' attempt to correct or supplement Aristotle's account of the nature of the moon. But other times, these corrections, quote-unquote, were disastrous. Aristotle quite properly rejected the existence of the void. But Strato of Lemsacus introduced the, the existence of micro-voids, little pores of non-existence, at as he thought that was necessary to explain the passage of light through glass or water. This trend in Aristotelian philosophy after Aristotle became especially bad when later Aristotelians engaged with the new and competing philosophical schools that emerged right after Aristotle, namely Epicureanism and Stoicism, and too often they compromised with them. A god's foreknowledge became an important issue for the Stoics, so Critoleos undertook to defend what he took to be a proper Aristotelian conception of divine providence, and he didn't do it very well. This compromising became especially problematic in ethics, which later, with later peripatetic ethics often leaning too close to Epicureanism or to Stoicism. Cicero even complains about the ethics of the peripatetic Hieronymus of Rhodes for this reason. He says, quote, why should I call him a peripatetic since he identified the greatest good with the absence of pain? And whoever disagrees with the greatest good disagrees with the whole, uh, disagrees uh, about the whole philosophical system, unquote, or at least the whole system of ethics, that's for sure. Uh, 
Some peripatetics similarly tried to make pleasure more of the standard, while others, influenced by Stoicism, downplayed any goods, we would say values, other than virtue, what Aristotle called the goods of the body and the external goods. But this leads us to what is likely a broader and deeper reason for the decline in Aristotelian philosophy after Aristotle. In the ancient context, I'd say that Aristotle's philosophy was the climax of the classical period. It was in its own way, and it, given, you know, we can qualify it given uh, what you heard described by, by Greg Salmeri early, but in its own way, to steal a line from Ayn Rand, it was a philosophy for living on earth. But with, Ma with the Macedonian conquest and the end of the classical era and the beginning of what's called the Hellenistic period, what was, what, in, what was wanted, it seems, what fit that era, was not a philosophy for living on earth, but a philosophy for withdrawing from it. And in such a culture, Stoicism, Epicureanism, and Platonism must have seemed more attractive. And I expect later peripatetic revisions of Aristotle's ethics were unfortunate attempts to make it more palatable for that age. And unsurprisingly, it didn't save Aristotelian philosophy. It merely watered it down. But I don't want to end on a negative note. A little bit of Aristotle goes a long way. After the loss of his works for centuries, the recovery of even some of them, and then transmitted via deeply, a d deeply religious philosopher, made possible the Renaissance. And in a sense, they made possible Ayn Rand and her philosophy as well. As you probably know, she, is, she said that the only philosophical debt she could acknowledge was to Aristotle. As Leonard Peikoff wrote in The Ominous Parallels, and I think this is clearly an implied reference to objectivism, quote, there is no future for the world except through a rebirth of the Aristotelian approach to philosophy. This would require an Aristotelian affirmation of the reality of existence, of the sovereignty of reason, of life on earth, and of the splendor of man, unquote. And after all, such a future is what these conferences are all about. So in conclusion, allow me to stipulate, and this can't be far wrong, that the last philosophical activity by Aristotelian philosophers on this hallowed ground took place in 223 AD. I am honored and fortunate to be here with you 1800 years later, re reviving that tradition. And since it's Easter, everywhere else except Greece. Let me say, Alathos Anestes, Aneste. He has risen, he being Aristotle. Thank you very much. Thank you. We can't talk without ending. Okay, we have 15 solid minutes for questions. Brief questions and brief answers means more questions. So Jonathan, one mic. We start from the gentleman here. Great talk, thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the interesting contrasts with the ancient world is this view of the nobility of man and these rational minds, etc. But yet they were slave societies, you know, a yes. huge proportion. Um, can you talk a little bit about Aristotle's view on slavery and were there anyone at that time period that was like an abolitionist or any one people who spoke against those ideas? Yeah, it's... Um I think this is one of those areas where I'll try to be brief because this, you know, you could give a lecture on this topic. Um, I think this is one of the areas where Aristotle's empiricism um, was unfortunate in the sense he looked around the ancient Aegean, the ancient Mediterranean, and everywhere was slave society. And it seemed to make possible the leisure that was so important for the best kind of life, as, as Greg described earlier. Um, so he defended... Uh, uh, he tried to defend the natural slavery, which I think in the context of the ancient time would have ruled out s certainly some of the slaves, uh, some of the kinds of slavery at the time. And there were, there, some, there were sophists who, were, um, who, regard, uh, who regarded um, slavery as it, it was just a convention, and there's no reason to think it was just or anything of that sort. So, um, yeah, Aristotle was uh, not at his best in this way, but I think it's... It was a very different context, and it was hard to come to a different conclusion. I don't want to say impossible, uh, but it, it, it was. Uh, that's, that's what it, I would say. Next question, so that the mic moves quickly. 
Shout it out, and I'll try to hear you. Oh, no, now it's perfect. Uh, that's, that's, okay, ignore the speaker. Uh, sure. These guys know. Uh, um, <laughs> in the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, one of the concepts that Aristotle goes into is megalosikia, yeah. greatness of soul, um, or the great souled man. Um, it's a concept related to excellence and greatness and men of pride and honor. Um, as an Aristotelian philosopher, could you, number one, explain uh, megalosikia a little bit more in depth? And number two, how would you relate it to Ayn Rand's worship of heroes? And maybe even Nietzsche's Yuvachmetsch. Um, I can't do all that in, a, in, a, in a, briefly. Um, I, I, I don't think the megalops, uh, the, the the proud man, the great souled man, is um, uh, uh, is the Ubermensch of uh, of Nietzsche. Um, there might be similarities, and there might be certain motivations of Nietzsche that were like um, that that were. I don't know, healthy in, in a way, uh, but it went off the rail. Um, but I can't really talk about that. Um, I see it as Aristotle's uh, great souled man is it's pride for a certain kind of person. So if you're an average person, uh, and that would be another difference between uh, Ayn Rand's ethics and, and Aristotle's, Pri you have to be a Pericles or someone like that. You have to be a mover and shaker in the world and also have all the virtues because pride, uh, megalosukia, is the crown of the virtues. So it's someone who recognizes one's greatness. And that recognizes one's moral greatness. It's, it's kind of being just to oneself. And he has a whole series of characteristics. You know, you're not a braggart and, and all that. But... Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot to, that one could say. Um, I would say that Ayn Rand's heroes have the virtue of pride, and the virtue of pride is, is has a lot of similarities to um, the great souled man, and I would have to leave it like at that. Um, I don't think heroes, the kind of heroes Aristotle wrote about, were always somewhat flawed, and that was kind of his the conception of tragedy at the time, for example, or even, even in Homer. I mean, Achilles has flaws. Um, so when and more importantly, how was it realized and accepted that philosophy and natural sciences were different disciplines? That's a question for someone who um, whose interests and knowledge go beyond the third century A.D. Uh, because I think it happened in the Middle Ages. You do get this idea that there is uh, philosophy, theology and then there are the special sciences and the, you know, the people who do medicine and, and things of that sort. I think certainly by the Renaissance, right, there is a sense that there's philosophy is the broad topic and then there's the special sciences. Um, but it didn't have, and it, I think it's natural because if people like Thales and Anaximander and Xenophanes, they see themselves as wanting to understand the world properly, not just based on these stories about the gods. And so that meant, you know, you're looking around, you're trying to explain what, what is the stuff that the world is made of, what is um, the cause of lightning, what are eclipses, it can't be the gods, there's no reason to think that, you know, what are earthquakes, and so it was all part of one inquiry uh, that was um, wisdom and, and knowledge, uh, but it's, uh, yeah, I, I can't say much because I'm not a historian of, of the science and I don't know too much about the Renaissance except, yeah, uh, so I would leave it at that. Um, yeah, there is um, there is a passage or a few passages in the writings of Hannah Arendt where she uh, criticizes uh, Aristotle for initiating uh, a political tradition uh, along with Plato, whereby uh, political authority in a state is seen as uh, equivalent to or modeled on the uh, relationship between uh, teachers and pupils, adults and children, which comes from the household, uh, which Arendt says infantilizes those uh, the politicians uh, rule over. Uh, I, I, I would like your opinion on that, whether you see it like that too, and uh, if this tradition has uh, subsisted until today, and what uh, Rand made of it. No, that I think is too much for one question, uh, given the time. But I'll talk about the first, just about Aristotle. Uh, I don't know Arendt uh, work very well. Um, he rejects that view explicitly. I mean, he says one of the problems with Plato uh, 
is Plato does not see a difference between rule over a household, uh, you know, the different kinds of rule, the uh, uh, um, rule over slave, rule over household, rule over uh, a city. It's all the same kind of thing. And even in the Republic, uh, one of the analogies he uses for describing uh, the, 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 the rule of um, political rule is of a family. And like the head of the family, uh, you know, the philosophers are going to be like father figures or something like that. Aristotle rejects that straight out. He says, what a parent does in running a household or father is, is, is different from, it's a different kind of rule. And one of the reasons it's different is that proper rule has to involve adults. I mean, in the sense of they have to be citizens. Uh, human beings that have a capacity for, you know, they have something to contribute to the city. So they're not children uh, at all. They can't be. Uh, now, there's going to be some issues that are, are problematic given some of the uh, things that uh, Greg talked about earlier about. Um, but one of the things Aristotle, um, one way he differed from Plato was he thought that every human being who has some kind of development is, you know, is a citizen. Are, are they're going to have some role to play. Whereas for, for Plato, you have only the, the philosopher kings who've grasped the forms, and that's you know, the null set. I mean, how many people do that? Uh, they, they're the ones who are qualified for, to rule. For Plato, that's not, for Aristotle, that's not true. Um, and that's going to be uh, one of the differences, one of the really significant differences between his political philosophy, whatever its flaws, and, uh, and Plato's. To what extent did Aristotle's disdain for the practical and practical pursuits and careers come from his influence from Plato, and how much of that was original? Um, yeah, Greg is the one to answer that question, because um, I like to, uh, since we're here celebrating Aristotle, I'd like to say it's just a platonic remnant. Uh, I think it's partly a platonic remnant. I think it's part the the not having enough empirical evidence or, I mean, Greg makes the point that there were these people who were, be, you know, making lies for themselves and Aristotle didn't take that uh, seriously. I don't want to misquote Greg, but um, uh, yeah, I don't, I, I, I can't, I, I think there's certainly a platonic remnant there, um, but that's, that, that's unlikely to be the whole story. Um, I have the. Can you hear me? Yeah. Oh, I'm I'm trying to look at yeah. <laughs> uh, I have a short question. Uh, who do you think was the first most important, first major figure after the let's say downfall of uh, Lycaon and the Aristotelian tradition that brought it back uh, before Aquinas, before because there were scholars like uh, in the Islamic world and. Maybe you have some one or two names that you yeah. think that they are the biggest ones. Yeah, apparently there's a, a rule, um, there's a law of the universe that you have to have an A in your name. I mean, you have to have an A name. Um, Aristotle, Alexander of Aphrodisias, Averroes, Aquinas, Ayn Rand. Uh, that's, um, that's the list. That's the A list. <laughs> so... <laughs> so. Can you summarize Aristotle on free will, or what was the name of the guy that... Alexander of Aphrodisias. Yeah. Um, not really. I would say this. Um, Aristotle and Plato was like that as well. They didn't discuss free will as an issue the way it was discussed soon after, because they took it as self-evident. They took it as self-evident that it was part of the nature of a human being to reason, and reason meant deliberation, and that involved a kind of capacity for choice. So I don't think it came up. There are, there are you know, scholars who argue that he was a soft determinist or something. I think that's BS. I think he, he recognized as virtually self-evident that it was part of our nature that we had this capacity for, for moral deliberation. He had book, book three, chapters one through five of the Nicomachean Ethics um, is about trying to figure out what, what act, kinds of actions are we are, uh, are blameworthy or praiseworthy for which we have moral responsibility and which ones aren't. Talks about the voluntary and the involuntary. I think it's there, but it's not discussed as an issue to be proven. I think he takes it as, as self-evident. What happens is the Stoics come along shortly thereafter and they argue for, um, for determinism. 
that there is no free will. And you get that throughout the Stoics. And at the same time, they're very, they regard uh, moral philosophy as very important. At most, you get the idea you can assent to the fact that you are a chip buffeted by forces beyond your control, to use Leonard Peikoff's word. You know, you can assent to it and say, yeah, they, that's the way it is. And you know, that's a kind of choice. But for the most part, there isn't any um, for the Stoics. Now, because of that, uh, it became an issue for the Aristotelians. And what um, Alexander of Aphrodisias does is in his work on fate, uh, he discusses uh, um, that. And also he wrote a number of works, uh, kind of questions and answers. And there's one of them, I forget the number exactly, where he's absolutely brilliant. It, sends, it sounds pretty close to being um, Ayn Rand. And I mean, he, he, uh, you know, he talks about how it's intimately connected to reason. He, he talks about the fact that the Stoics don't understand that there are different kinds of causality and it's not all the same. And the, the causality involved in a free will choice, um, uh, he uses the language, what is up to us, uh, is how they put it. Um, th that is something different from you know, mechanistic things or, or the, the causality involved in plants, and etc. So it's really quite good. And he also had a, a good, um, he had an idea of the whole, what's called the, the contradiction of determinism that in order to argue for um, uh, for that, that in order to argue for determinism you have to you know use your reason which is uh, um, it, which you know involves choices etc so he was pretty excellent um, do you know what Aristotle's views were on Alexander's conquest did he look down on them did he have any opinion um, not beyond um, what I quoted, uh, Alexander didn't treat um, non-Greeks as, bar you know, as um, animals. He even says animals at one point. I, I, I made the, the quote briefer. Um, he seemed to, uh, you know, he, he left in, when he conquered Egypt, for example, he left the Ptolemies in charge and then he moved on. But his attitude was let them run the country the way they do as long as, you know, we're in control. And I don't know that Aristotle... That would have been his idea, but then I don't know whether conquest would have been uh, part of his um, his, his view. Uh, but I don't know. I can't I can't rule out the fact that I mean he thought that the Greek city state was really the best political system by far. Uh, Persia was a slave state. The Scythians are all kind of subhuman in a way because they're just nomadic, and that's not a, a real human life. And and you know maybe if Alexander. Uh, conquered that region and imposed a city-state, um, that would be a good thing, but he doesn't do that. Um, he's, uh, uh, Macedonia was a monarchy. That's one of the reasons why the, um, the Greeks regarded these, I don't want to say like Canada, to America, but they're, they're these people to the north that speak our language, sort of. They believe the same gods that we do, but they're not quite like us. They're not as good as us because they're monarchies. You know, they haven't even gotten it you know, to the point that what we want are small city-states. And so there was a kind of contempt there. And then, you know, Canada conquered the U.S. in effect <laughs> and the world. Okay. Yes.